Okay, the masked professor is once more on the air. Hello, ladies and germs. And welcome to the very last lecture of the spring 2020 semester. I am, of course, your genial host, Harry Whiting. So let us plunge boldly into today's uh, lecture, a continuation on Chapter 14, uh, Safety and Accident Prevention. All right. As you remember last time, we had left off with human error. Now we're going to pick up with hazard identification and control. Uh-oh. I've already identified a human error. I forgot my book. Luckily, it's a mere hop, skip, and a jump to my office uh, from where we're shooting this video. All right. Oh, meanwhile, back at the ranch. All right, so hazard identification and control. The introduction to this is first we talk about system safety and accident prevention. We have to identify uh, potential hazards. We have to look at the accident frequency rates for different tasks. Um, and in what particular environment. Oh, that's good. So we're going to cover uh, a couple of methods to identify the hazards in design and design controls for them. All right, so we have to think about hazard criticality and risk. Hazard criticality, well, people argue about what... Uh, Um, okay. What is, uh, what should be the, um, um, all right, finally, oh, bloody hell, uh, argue about what hazard criticality is. Is it synonymous with risk? Many people think of it as a combination of the probability and severity. Under uh, probability, uh, we think in terms of the frequency of accidents uh, with categor categorization of their frequency, their probability is it, uh, uh, or excuse me, these are the, uh, from most severe to least severe. Frequent, probable, occasional, remote, and improbable. When we talk about severity, we mean severity of injury. In MIL standard 882B, they have categories of catastrophic, critical, marginal, and negligible. Okay, so we look at 
the hazard assessment on 370 and up. All right, so we're talking frequent, probable, occasional, remote, improbable. Frequent and catastrophic is listed as a one. One is the most severe you can have. Probable and catastrophic two, occasional and catastrophic four, and you can see right on. So we have this table that kind of shows us from the worst severity down to where negligible meets improbable and we put that at the least severity. Remember to shift back this time. All right, so with 1 as the most severe and 20 as the lowest rating, although I might have been tempted to go the other way, but hey, I didn't design the table. All right, so we have to get into hazard identification. When we're designing equipment or systems, We're going to look for all possible hazards under all environmental conditions in which these um, the equipment or, or system might be operated. All aspects of every task, all possible foreseeable use of the equipment. Uh, so, and our equipment needs to be analyzed in combination with the other equipment used. And again, all other possible environments. We do a preliminary hazards analysis. Uh, we do this before we get into the more detailed methods. So we evaluate the combinations of task actions. Who are our potential users? What are our potential environments? Deve uh, develop a list of our possible hazards. Estimate the likelihood of accidents occurring from those hazards. Estimate the severity of the consequences and uh, list our potential corrective me measures. All right, so that brings us to uh, failure modes and effects affect criticality analysis, uh, or FMECA. This is an extension of the failure modes and effects analysis um, that has been a staple of safety for a long time. So we look at every system and every subsystem. We break it down into all of its uh, uh, constituent elements. Our analysis, which could be you, studies and identifies and identifies different ways of breaking down or functioning incorrectly. In other words, the failure modes that we talk about up here. What are the effects of component failure on other parts of the system? And remember that part of the system might be that human being. All 
All right, so when we do a failure modes and effects criticality, criticality analysis, well, um, we're giving our hazards a, a score that is based on the criticality of the effect they might have. Uh, again, this should extend to humans and human error that will be involved in the system. Our analyst looks at each step within the task analysis and lists the types of errors that could occur and the possible effects of errors. Okay, and now let's look at table uh, 14.4 on 372. I've been using this book a long time. You can see I've got little highlighter marks. Uh, right, so oh, get this over a little. There we go. Uh, all right, so human error components for an FMECA for a lawnmower. Well, the human error component might be that set the blade torque. The torque is too high, the torque is too low. Either way, the bolt experiences too much stress and breaks, and the blade comes off the motor. Criticality, they have down as a six. Um, it's, um, well, uh, look, a lawnmower is an inherently dangerous uh, object. Um, when I was just a young uh, kid, uh, my father once jerked the lawnmower back and uh, cut up the very front of his foot because my sister had wandered out and she was just a baby at the time. Uh, so he spent a night in the hospital while they fixed that. Today, though, that has happened often enough that now they have a little flap at the back of the lawnmower that if you pull it back, that flap goes up and protects your foot. Pretty clever. All right, check uh, mower blade, fail to see blade cracks. You'll notice mm, they don't really have any other uh, part of their table uh, filled up for that. Now, of course, there are all sorts of other uh, human errors that could be made with a lawnmower. Uh, you might uh, stick your fingers under there to make sure it's running. Uh, <laughs> well, well, you can't even actually think of everything people might do. Uh, they might reach in to clear the grass that's clogged up the output and uh, reach in too far. There's a lot of exciting things that could happen. All right, so the failure modes and effects criticality analysis is one way. Um, another way is fault tree analysis, right? So our failure modes and effects criticality analysis, no S, uh, starts with a mo molecular view. In other words, it's breaking everything down to the smallest possible uh, uh, element. Well, it, that's a bottom-up method. Uh, fault tree analysis works as a top-down analysis. So, we start from an incident or an undesirable event, and we work our way down to what could be the possible uh, uh, causes. Those causes might include conditions in our physical system, events that happen while we're running the system, human errors, 
combinations of these. As I said last time, it is rare for an accident to be just one thing happened and then people were injured. It's usually a chain of events that gets us to that accident or that injury. All right, so then for each identified event or condition, our analyst works downward to identify the possible causes. Um, The fault trees show combinations of causal factors, right? Again, any kind of accident or incident is rarely just one thing happens and then there's an accident or incident. So we have our causal factors and they result in the next level that gets us towards that accident or incident. A fault tree uses Boolean and or logic to link causal factors together. Now, I'm not sure how y'all's education goes. I know that when I was in engineering school, it seems like I was in four different classes one semester that we're all talking about Boolean logic. Okay, carry on with that. Um, all right, so we are going to look at So Boolean logic is very often used in electronics and computer logic. So we have the AND condition where you have to have two different feeds in, A and B, for C to happen. Or we have what's called an OR gate. In that case, if A happens, then C happens. Or, if B happens, then C happens. So you remember our discussion of fire from part one of this presentation. We determined that you have to have three different things for fire to happen. You have to have fuel, you have to have an oxidizer, and you have to have an ignition source. All right, so is fuel, blah, is fuel present, right? It has to be one of three things that feeds in to make a fire. Is the oxidizer present? Again, one of the three things that you have to have. But the ignition source, you notice, is an OR gate. It can be an open flame that provides the ignition source. It could be a lighted match that provides the ignition source. It could be a hot, surf, uh, hot, bleh, hot surface that uh, provides the ignition source or an electric spark. And they just kind of cowardly put out others here. And I'm sure that these are not all the ways we can start a fire. Okay, so switching back to computer, have to remember to switch back. All right, now, because of this method, fault trees are very powerful in hazard identification. Uh, the advantage is it systematically identifies uh, single causes. 
it identifies multiple interacting causes of accidents. Now, single, single points of failure are more likely than combinations. Um, so, our single points of failure causes should have higher priority for creating controls for those hazards. Uh, but a single point of failure can pass upward through an OR gate, but not an AND gate. All right, now, you shouldn't uh, think of either of these two methods as standalone. We use fault trees in conjunction with the failure modes and effects criticality analysis or other methods of hazards, hazard identification. All right, and we already looked at figure 14.3. All right, so when we're talking about hazard controls, how do we identify them? Well, look, there's a lot of safety uh, information available, right? So there are entire books on safety. Uh, I took a course on system safety uh, when I was taking my master's degree. There are articles, there are entire magazines that are devoted just to uh, industrial safety. There's the National Safety Council. They give recommendations. They uh, put out information. Journals and conferences in industrial uh, uh, safety are also available. All right, so there shouldn't be any shortage of ways to find and identify the hazard. So, we're going to do a safety analysis to develop a list of hazards. So, we're going to create a hazards controls table, and that is going to uh, list the criticality of all the hazards. We're going to generate all possible controls. The best is when we generate controls that design, uh, design the hazard out. We're going to uh, generate ways that we can guard against the hazard. And we want to, um, you know what, I don't like different, I want alternative. So we want to look and think of as many ways of controlling the hazard as we can. Um, you know, this can be a, a brainstorming thing, uh, or you may have to do it on your own. All right. Now, some factors that we have to consider. What if... Other hazards are introduced by our hazard control alternatives. We may need to keep digging deeper. What are the effects of control on the subsequent usefulness of the product? Is it still going to be useful or have we totally destroyed its ability to do the job by designing out the hazard? What is the effect of the control on the cost of the product? It is possible, in, in fact, maybe even easy, to design a product that is too expensive uh, for people to buy. But one thing we can do is benchmark, compare our controls to other similar products. Uh, benchmarking is always something that we should do when we're thinking in these areas. 
All right, so what is going to affect the manufacturing cost that's related to our hazard control? Well, there can be disadvantages and advantages to uh, uh, controls. We want to consider all those different alternatives that we generated earlier and say, what are the advantages of this? What are the disadvantages for each one? Maybe there are ways we can combine several so we have more advantages and fewer disadvantages. In the end, we're going to end up choosing one control that we're going to recommend. Our, uh, then our designers are going to go over the product again and make sure that we haven't designed in some kind of defect that makes the product uh, unusable or poorly usable at best. All right, so when we talk about reduction of hazards, we assign priorities to different ways a hazard can happen. At the source of the hazard is always the best place to design it out. But we always have to ask, can our product function if we design that out? The path to the hazard, usually a barrier or site, a safeguard, is what we use uh, for that. When we're talking about the person, well, first of all, if they're supposed to use uh, personal protective equipment, that um, uh, that can always be removed, and in fact, often is. I noticed during the COVID crisis how many people have their damn masks covering their neck and not their uh, nose and mouth. Curse those people. What we uh, may need to do is actually change the people's behavior that are going to use our product. Um, and we are ultimately may have to rely on warnings or training, both of which are less reliable. All right, well, finally, we have administrative controls. Uh, so administrative uh, procedures, uh, we might have shift rotation, mandatory rest breaks, and sanctions for incorrect or risky behavior. Uh, okay, well, uh, shift rotation, I've already talked about in terms of fatigue, uh, and that being a problem in safety. Uh, mandatory rest breaks, um, uh, that can be very useful. Uh, sanctions for incorrect or risky behavior, we have to be careful what those are. The wrong ones can just make the person resentful. And our last administrative control is to actually have legislation that addresses the problem. Wow, that is a weak read to rest your hopes on. All right, so safety management. Uh, first of all, we want proper design of uh, equipment. Um, and uh, obviously that is a very important idea. We want to ass assess our facility safety, take remedial actions to enhance the safety, 
And if we don't have them now, we want to make sure that we have formal accident or incident investigations. All right, so safety programs, having the employees involved makes a big, big difference in the effectiveness of a safety program. Uh, I have seen safety programs where all they do is dump safety in the laps of the managers and say, good luck with that, <clears throat> doesn't work very well. All right, so we have different stages in our safety program. First, we, have, we identify risks to the company. Now, you may be saying, wait, what about the poor employee? Injuring the employee is already a risk to the company. We want to develop and implement safety programs And those may be slightly different in different parts of the company. Um, the safety that we look for in the office is not going to be the same as the safety we look for on the shop floor. And we need to measure our program effectiveness. All right, so first we're identifying our risks. The very first thing we need to do is we need to do a full assessment of all our facilities in that we're going to evaluate the existing hazards that we have. We're going to evaluate the hazard controls that we have. We are going to look at accident frequency as an indicator of places where there are particular problems. And, there you go, company. Uh, we're going to look at company losses from accident and incident claims. Okay, well, fantastic. All right. So, uh, part of that is going to be to analyze documents. Uh, so, we're going to look at accident and incident reports the safety records that we have of whatever kind and our training materials. Are we training people well enough that they recognize what is a hazard? All right, uh, this is kind of a, pla a strange place to put it, but it's where the book put it. Uh, what uh, the OSHA injury categories are that you can be struck by something that something can happen with your body mechanics. You try and lift too much and injure your back or your shoulder. Uh, you can get lacerations, cuts, tears, and punctures. You can come in contact with temperature extremes. You can have a fall, slip, or trip. You can be caught in between two things and that could be nasty. I actually, uh, a companero of mine uh, once got that when, uh, uh, when our dumbass truck do driver closed the doors on the truck when he was securing a large box. And when the truck driver took off, the uh, box slammed into... Uh, uh, f slammed into my compañero and injured him severely. Uh, you could be struck against, something can throw you against uh, something, uh, eye injuries, and miscellaneous. Boy, is that a helpful category. All right, so... As part of our identifying risks, we are going to interview supervisors and employees. We're going to uh, have observational an analysis. Now look, all too often people are being taught 
you can manage everything from your office. And that is not true. Go out and look. Uh, so we use the safety checklists. Usually we base those on the OSHA general industry standard, uh, 1910. And uh, in table 14.5, we have an example checklist. I know I'm all excited to see it. All right. All right, so we've got fall-related hazards and electrical hazards on this one. Uh, obviously, there are many more hazards. This is just an example of part of what we would be looking for. Uh, so are foreign objects present on the walking surface or in the walking paths? Are there design flaws in the walking surface? Are there slippery areas on the walking surface? Right, so you get the um, uh, idea on that one. Electrical hazards, are short circuits present anywhere? Are static electricity hazards present anywhere? Are electric, electrical conductors in close enough proximity to cause an arc? So you get the, the picture where there are specific things within the checklist that you would be looking for. Ugh. Ugh. All right, so we're developing a list of ha hazards from all these activities that we've been looking at. We want a proactive rather than reactive uh, approach. Too often, though, people, uh, managers are more interested in reaction than proaction. Uh, again, the reason for that is that human beings have trouble forecasting the future. damn future non-forecasters. Uh, all right, so we want to do a job safety analysis on every job in the facility. We want a heavy involvement of our employees. This uh, benefits us by having employee awareness of hazards and it's um, very efficient to have employees identify hazards. In fact, in my experience, employees often try and identify hazards to management and they're often ignored. All right, so we want to implement our safety program. A safety program has elements that must be in place for it to be successful. We have to have management involvement. Um, the idea that safety starts somewhere below the executive suite is a horrible way of thinking. We have to have accident and incident investigations. An accident is when somebody is injured. An incident is when it almost happens, but it didn't. We want recommendations for changes in the equipment, in the environment, uh, and in the job that are going to make them uh, everything safer. Uh, we want specific safe, safety rules and 
we want to look at what do we need to add in employee training. A great thing to do with a safety program is have safety promotion, have feedbacks and incentives uh, um, about different aspects of safety. Uh, I know that was one of the positive things about working uh, at the Army Depot when I worked with Texas A&M. Once a month they would have a, uh, a safety lecture. Now, of course, part of the reason that they were doing that was that they were one of the five worst facilities in the entire Department of Defense network, but we'll blow that off. Uh, all right, so after we implement changes, we are going to uh, use walkthroughs and check our compliance. Uh, having a, a safety program is the most effective thing that we could do after designing and guarding against hazards. Again, we need that participatory uh, approach with management and employees, everybody on the same page uh, about uh, safety. So when we're providing training, we want to give them knowledge of the hazards, examples of safe behavior, and we want to check that beliefs and attitudes are changing using our feedback and incentives. Well, once we have that safety program, we want to measure that safety program effectiveness. So we already saw how we're going to collect our initial baseline data. We're going to continue collecting data. Uh, collecting data never ends. And the program effectiveness measures that we are going to use as our metrics are things like safe behaviors, are people acting safely or unsafely, our accident incident rates, our number of injuries or deaths, our number of days off from injuries, and our OSHA logs, which should contain data about all our accidents and incidents. All right, well one thing uh, about uh, our safety program is we should have accident and incident investigations. OSHA requires an investigation of all accidents. Uh, in some industries, such as the oil indus industry, they also require investigation of incidents. One thing that happens a lot, though, is incidents don't end up getting reported. So as part of our safety program, we have to encourage reporting incidents. All right, so an incident, again, occurrence that could have resulted in injury or death. A near miss is also an incident. All right, so when we're having an accident uh, investigation, we need to secure the evidence, right? Evidence could be uh, liquids that have been spilled, uh, could be uh, uh, pieces of shrapnel, if, uh, if a vessel ruptured or uh, a machine flew to pieces, uh, we should take as many pictures of the site as possible, not disturb it until we've taken a lot of pictures uh, so that we can put that together 
uh, in a way that we're going to be able to make sense of what happened. So we don't want to disturb, disturb the uh, scene of the accident any more than we have to to remove people that are injured immediately. We want to do ex extensive interviewing of the employees that were involved, of the manager or supervisor for the area, any witnesses, we want to collect any information we can. If we found strange liquids at the scene, we don't know what they are. We get samples. We find out what they are. We uh, do analysis of our different pieces of evidence. Um, and we have to draw a conclusion. What happened? We can't just say, okay, well, we've analyzed the evidence and done all this other stuff. No big deal. No. What is the conclusion that we can, uh, that we can draw? What happened? Was it partly human error? Was it totally because a machine had not been maintained correctly, what happened? All right, so we already know that we have safety regulators. Uh, uh, OSHA uh, sometimes is very proactive in making sure people are complying. There's also MSHA, the Mining Safe Safety and Health Administration. Uh, we have to remember that it is going to be the manager's choice whether or not to implement safety programs. Some of the considerations that come into that, well, first of all, it's going to cost money. It's going to slow productivity down. People are going to have to take at least some time off to get training or uh, uh, work on hazard identification, etc. It may be presented to the upper management as a total loss. Why should we do this? So there's a bias towards allowing these kind of unsafe practices to continue. But we need to consider what are the costs of unsafe operations. One injury, one death, could end up costing the company millions and millions of dollars, much more than implementing a safety uh, program would have. All right, so that brings us to risk-taking and warnings. Well, risk-taking is a decision uh, process. Uh, people are ultimately responsible for safe behavior. So that means proper use of ladders, correct job procedures, cautious driving, using seat belts, or not overriding safeguards. Uh, overriding safeguards is a very common uh, uh, human thing, right? It goes back to that, well, I've done it hundreds of times and never gotten hurt. Oh, yeah, great. And what happens on the hundred uh, and first time? All right, so people are choosing safe or unsafe, and that is a knowledge-based decision, but um, what if knowledge is defective? It may become a rule-based decision. Oh, I know that the rule is I can't go in that enclosure when the machine is running. Okay, great. What we want is we want to make automatic decision to do the safe thing, the mode. 
All right, so we have factors uh, that influence the decision to act safely. Um, first of all, people have to know a hazard exists. Um, if somebody came to New Mexico and they knew nothing at all about snakes, and uh, one day they saw one and they said, oh, that's a very large worm. And it turned out to be a venomous snake. Uh, we do have some venomous snakes here. That could be a problem. Okay, so they have to know what are the available actions. What uh, that generation of alternatives that we talked about in the chapter about decision. Know the consequences of safe versus unsafe behavior. So they are evaluating uh, uh, the alternatives. Now, some, uh, uh, some research seems to indicate that choosing safe actions is an analytical, knowledge-based decision sometimes. Uh, using utility theory or some other uh, uh, situation. So, unfortunately, they may use simplifying heuristics, satisficing, saying that, um, um, okay, well, that's safe enough for the government job. Uh, sometimes they'll do more extensive analysis, maybe even evaluating with a mental model. Of course, that depends on our quality and completeness of the knowledge base. So, in turn, that relies on the avail uh, availability of the information in the long-term memory. All right, so utility theory, as I said, comes in sometimes. What are is the expected frequency of the consequence, right? Uh, if it's one in a thousand, they may say, oh, it's only one in a thousand. Well, of course, you pr rarely precisely know the odds to that degree. Uh, if the severity of injury would be large, that has a bigger effect than the likelihood of injury. All right. So what about intentions to behave in a safe manner? Well, Part of that are the variables that are related to how severe is the hazard and or injury. Of course, part of it is the novelty of the hazard. Uh, and is their exposure voluntary? how familiar they are with the item or the product. You know, so to go back to my um, uh, person that has never been in New Mexico, they say, oh, there's a large worm. Uh, I think I'll pick it up and see uh, more about it. Okay, how many snake bite stories have started exactly that way? All right. So we have these related cognitive stages. Um, what is the risk perception? In other words, the knowledge of the likelihood and severity of injury. What is the availability of risk, of that risk in the memory? And then, of course, um, as always happens with human factors, there is 
the cost factor. So w what is the cost of compliance? Having to wear personal protective equipment has a negative effect on the judging of odds. So very often people will decide not to wear their personal protective equipment because they're like, oh, it's too heavy. Oh, I don't like what it does to my face. Oh, whatever. Part of that is the framing bias um, of this. If the cost of compliance has a certain negative cost, that may persuade people not to wear their PPE. If it has an uncertain probabilistic cost of accident or injury, eh. Look, we have to remember, people tend to engage in risky behaviors. Um, that's one reason that we have car insurance. Uh, you may be a really safe driver, but what about that idiot that's approaching, uh, approaching you at 100 miles an hour? All right, so let's talk about written warnings and warning labels. Well, warnings are the easiest and cheapest protection we can get for uh, from liability lawsuits. But they have to be targeted for every foreseeable use of the tool or equipment. Um, so once when I um, gave my adopted nephew some fireworks, I wrote up a whole list, a whole warning label list, you know, do not put in nose, uh, avoid holding in mouth while lighting, uh, all kinds of silly uh, things like that. Uh, of course, if you've bought fireworks, you know there are already warning labels on them. So they can be written warnings that convey the hazards of the product or the equipment. Again, the goal is to affect the intentions and behavior of the people using it. We want to avoid having an accident, injury, or death. Hmm. How about a comma after that? Um, so, but remember, warnings and warning labels are the third choice on our hazard reduction list options. All right, so our warnings should include a signal word. Danger means there's an immediate hazard leading to severe injury or death. Warning could result in injury or death. Caution could cause minor personal injury or property damage. So they should include a description of the hazard, consequences of the hazard, the behavior to avoid the hazard, and figure 14.4. Oh, no, wait, I'm, I'm going to show that to you. All right, so you'll notice here's a warning label. It says warning. We have an icon of a guy wearing goggles. It says wear eye protection, serious eye injury, such as blindness, retinal detachment, secondary glaucoma, and eye globe rupture may occur when not wearing eye protection. Man, that's scary stuff. All right, so when we're designing our warnings, we have to realize people may not see them or read them. 
So we place them next to something that has to be looked at. People have to be able to read the words or interpret the icons. So it has to be a legible font size, has to have good contrast, short, simple text, easily interpreted pictures or icons. All right. First of all, people aren't good at interpreting uh, pictures or icons. Um, so we have to be uh, uh, aware of that. Uh, right? They don't know the difference between danger, warning, caution. A lot of times labels are just ignored. Uh, did you look at the label? Oh, hell no. Why worry? People have to comply with the warning for it to do any good. And one last figure, and we promise we'll stop. All right, so this is uh, a, a fault tree analysis um, Uh, and uh, it's for warning labels generally, right? So we have an accident. That has to be an AND gate where there's an unsafe act and there's a system vulnerability. If we have designed out the hazard, no vulnerability. The unsafe act has to have either the safety implications were understood or they were not known. All right, if they were understood, it's got to be either there was too high a cost of compliance or an intentional violation. If that's not known, the warning was not perceived or the warning was not read or the warning was not comprehended. Often, warnings are so bizarrely uh, uh, worded that they aren't comprehended. So under not perceived, it was either poorly placed or the operator was distracted. Okay. Not read, poor visibility, maybe the language is unknown. You know, I never really got a grasp on how to read Polish. I just memorized what the names of some of my favorite dishes were so I could go to a restaurant and do the usual American thing of point, grunt, and hold out money. If the warning is not comprehended, it could be because the person isn't fluid either in reading or the language or is poor wording. I'm really sorry that the semester is over. I would have liked to have gone into the human factors of transportation where I have a certain amount of experience and expertise uh, and some of the other chapters in the book. But I guess that's going to have to wait for future human factors classes. I have put together This outline as a way to transition to making uh, uh, PowerPoint shows for each of the fa uh, each of the uh, chapters. Uh, although I've been roundly criticized, I won't say by whom uh, for this approach. Anyway. Stay safe, stay healthy, and when the fields are white with daisies, 
we'll meet again.